Okay, it's 10.15 and we can go. I got 30 minutes to give you all the stuff that I need to tell you. Uh, my name is Pramod Sadalge and I work for ThoughtWorks. I've been with ThoughtWorks for almost 20 years now. And I started doing Agile in 1999. Uh, Martin and Watt Cunningham were the coaches that we got. And this talk is a basically amalgamation of all the knowledge I have acquired over that time and all the projects I have done and things like that. Uh, so in 30 minutes, I'm planning to do all of that. But I'm here all day today, so if you find me later in the hallway somewhere, grab me and we can have a specific conversation to your particular context, right? All right. So we heard a lot about in the, what DevOps is in the keynote, and I think it was a good uh, talk, especially to guide to my conversation, right? Uh, basically, what is DevOps? Like Jez Humpel, who wrote Continuous Delivery, talked about it's basically cross-disciplinary uh, thing that happens between devs and ops, right? And more important is, there are some things that developers do. Again, uh, I think Andrew talked about this, like developers are incentivized to change, and ops people are incentivized to keep it stable, which is a constant tension between uh, these two sides of the shop, right? So basically, like if you can respond to changes in the marketplace, that's what developers do, change features and stuff like that. And as a system, you need to stay stable, like you don't want to see a 404, or you don't want to see a stack trace or something on your website or something like that. So that's where keeping things stable comes. Like in reality, your job is to keep the business running. It, it, your job is to keep, allow the business to change, to changing conditions in the marketplace. That's our job as people in the IT industry or as people working in a company. Our job is to keep, allow the business to change, right? Or allow the business to evolve. So given that context, what does it mean to be like DevOps enabled to, or to do DevOps practices on a data side of the shop, right? So first of all, integrating your data people with your developers is a big uh, starting point, right? Like integrate them, pair them, um, involve them in discussions. Don't just like develop a feature and throw over and say, now deploy this into UAT or QA or production and things like that. That's where pairing helps. Uh, one of the big things Andrew talked about is put everything in version control. Like, doesn't matter what it is. Like, sometimes we tend to have data stuff or uh, database related stuff not in version control. Like, the software goes along in version control somewhere, and the DBAs then basically interject in the middle, saying, oh, here's your version of the database, and you're supposed to kind of work together. And that fails a lot of times. Like, you see errors in production, like table not found, column not found, or this version is old stored proc, this is new, and that kind of stuff all happens. A good way to get away from all of that is put everything in version control. Doesn't matter what it is about the project or about the system. It could be your data model, it could be your views or stored procs or triggers or your schema, or it could be even some discussions you had on a whiteboard and you took pictures. Put that in version control, doesn't matter, because once you go to version control, you have all of the information in one place, right? That's a big uh, enabler for teams in terms of communication, in terms of sharing, in terms of like uh, collaborating, in terms of keeping everything on one place. It is also a good thing for a bus factor, like what if your DBA gets hit by a bus, right? If stuff is on, your, on his laptop, then you have lost that stuff. So if everything is in version control, it gives you a safe place to put everything. So here's an example of a project that I was working for almost six years on, like everything is in here, like all your uh, development stuff, but at the same time, every, in DB, there's a bunch of stuff, like how do I back up, what's the data models, if there's any migration, if there's anything performance-related testing I do, or if there's any tools specifically for QA people that we do, or if there's any tools I wrote for my own purpose, for the data people, all those are in the same place, right? So it's a very easy way to like share and communicate with others on the team uh, or people who uh, come to the team, right? Another good practice that a lot of times happens is we tend to write a lot of boilerplate code, like a views or triggers or stored procs or stuff like that. If you can generate them, generate them. Like you could write some program that basically looks at a table structure and generates a trigger for you, for example, auditing purposes. Or if there's a practice in your company of putting views on all the tables so people get read access, don't handwrite the view, just generate those views. Because all the bugs that get happened because of handwriting small stuff in a repetitive fashion can just go away by generating that kind of code. And you can put that generation into a, a CI pipeline so that every time a build comes out, all that stuff is regenerated for you and is fresh 
matches the latest table structures, matches the latest uh, whatever design philosophy you have. And if you need to change something, you can just change the generation code and all the stuff that gets generated is throw away so you can rebuild that. So putting a lot of that kind of stuff under generation helps a lot, right? So here's a, here's a very good example of generating uh, code for like granting like access to tables, right? Like you may have tables that you grant access to someone or like read only, read write, or just update access and that kind of stuff. Here's a simple table, uh, like a Ruby code that just grants all of this to a bunch of roles and that kind of stuff. Once this runs, it generates a script, you run the script, you're done, right? As a DBA or as a data person, you're responsible in maintaining this. The output of that is automatically run, right? So again, you're elevating yourself from the mundane tasks of typing this stuff up to a different level, right? Again, DevOps, like Andrew said in the keynote, is a lot of about automation. So this is one other uh, step to automate that kind of stuff. Right? You can also use Docker images. Like Docker is a new uh, technology that's been around for two, three years or so. You can do a lot with these kind of uh, Docker images that you can publish. You can uh, have certain versions of them. Uh, you may have like uh, different versions of your code running in different places, different customer bases. Uh, if you wanted to get a database that matches a particular customer or that kind of stuff, you can have Docker images of this stuff around. And whenever a developer wants a certain version, they can just pull that Docker image and work with it, right? It could also be used for uh, specific uh, testing, like here's a QA version of the Docker image, and here's a UAT version, here's a production version. So if someone's fixing a production bug, they can just pull the production version, work with that, and then when they are done, they just pull back the dev version, and they're back at the trunk line instead of like two releases ago or stuff like that. So we use a lot of this kind of uh, stuff in the pipeline to ensure automation so that the developers are not waiting for certain things from the data people, right? So here's a good example. So I have some test data that is very specific to a particular customer, and I have a schema that matches. So I put that in the database and create an image of that and publish it out as a Docker image. If certain person wants to work with this kind of setup, they can just pull that Docker image, and you can run functional tests against it, you can run unit tests against it, and stuff like that. If some specifications of the schema changes or the test data changes or whatever, I can just put them back in here, create the image, and publish again. So when the developer is pulling that out again, they get the latest copy or the latest version of how it's supposed to look, right? So there is no, there is, so there is no uh, need for the developers or whoever is running here coming back to the data people asking, I need a version that matches this because the version is already published by you when that changes, right? So this is a good way of using uh, Docker and some test data and some sch schema that matches it in a pipeline so that there's always the latest version of Docker available for testing for the devs or for the QAs, for any business people. You may have salespeople who go out on demos so that you can just give out a Docker image on their laptop so they can use it for demo purposes, whatever different uses uh, for that particular thing. You can also let the developers provision their own database, right? Like Docker is a provision database that has everything in it. You can also do that same thing for the developers also. Like let's, as a developer, I'm changing a bunch of stuff on my application as new features come in, and I need a database where I can test this stuff out, right? So it could be a schema, it could be a stored proc, views, or whatever that I need to change. And a good way to do that is let them provision their own stuff, uh, especially like if you have developers, they'll provision their own, their own app server, for example. They'll provision their own uh, web logic or web sphere or anything that they have. They'll do that on their own laptop. So why not the database also on their own laptop with all the schema and all the test data and all the other stuff that goes with it? So here's an example of how uh, that can be done, right? So let's say some new developer joins the project and they can just clone a repo that they have, uh, your project repo, whatever that is, right? And they're just gonna change some build properties to basically showcase their own name, right? Let's say Bob joins the team, and Bob's gonna say, change the build properties. He said, I need a schema called Bob, uh, password is Bob, and that's it, that's all I need. And they can say, create schema, and it basically goes in and creates a schema for Bob, all right? Now imagine Bob is also working on release 2.2 that's in production, and he can just come in here and change the builder properties to Bob 2.2 or 2-2 or something like that. 
and just create a schema again for themselves. So they could have multiple versions of this going on at the same time without any waiting period going on when they send an email to the data team saying, I need a schema, matching production, and stuff like that. Right? So again, a, a step of automation where the data team can provide these tools to the developers and then abstract themselves away from mundane, repeatable tasks that can be done automated. Right? So here's, now here Bob got a schema for themselves uh, so that they can create a schema and do work with it. Right? So now they can connect to that. So the next obvious step is, OK, I got a schema to work with. How do I get my schema objects in there? How do I get my schema code in there and stuff like that? Right? So they can do that too, uh, like using migration frameworks and things, things like that. Has anyone heard of these frameworks at all? Right? So there's a bunch of frameworks out there. Like I think they started coming around since 2005 or something like that. Uh, there's DB Deploy. I worked on this project and open sourced this like around 2004 or something like that. But there's a bunch of projects around nowadays, and all of them are good in their own context. So depending on your context, if you need some commercial support or something like that, you could take Redgate, DB Maestro, Datical. These companies provide commercial support and training and that kind of stuff. A bunch of these are all uh, open source, free to use, that kind of stuff. Uh, Flyway is the one that has the most activity nowadays. But all of them are good, like if you're using Rails or Ruby, so there's Rails migrations is built into the framework, uh, or similarly DB maintain and Liquibase and things like that are there. Right? So you can pick one of these frameworks and start using them. Most of these frameworks follow the philosophy of, I can make a change to a database, which is a delta or a migration from version 1 to version 2. Or you can abstract it by saying from version n to version n plus 1. Right? So it's a good way to just apply my changes, whatever those are, to an existing state of the database. Right? A lot of times when you change code, it's very easy. Like you change code, it compiles. As long as all the internal stuff calling to each other is fine and the API calls are fine, you can just compile and deploy that. Because code doesn't carry state with it. A database carries state with it. So refactoring or changing a database is a little bit more complicated than changing code. Right? A very good example of that is, let's say I change the name column in a database from just name to first name and last name. Right? Now I'm splitting the table or splitting the column into two different columns. In my code, I can just add one more attribute and could rename them, first name, last name, and all the code compiles, it's all fine. But in the database, I need to ensure I add two more columns, split the data, migrate the data over, so that all the customers who were called Something before are the same now too, right? Because database carries state, refactoring or changing a database is much more complicated than changing code. And customers or your business people don't like when you lose data, right? So you need to be a little bit more careful and a little bit more thorough about following certain practices, right? So here's migration frameworks is an example of how to use that, right? So here I'm using DB Deploy. And if you see this here, I'm applying a bunch of migrations. I'll talk a little bit later into detail about what each migration consists of. But this is a way to apply migrations. right? And most of these frameworks look into the database and say what all migrations have already been applied. And look into your file system and see what all have not been applied. Take a delta of that and apply whatever was not applied. right? Does that make sense? So if, let's say, I have uh, seven migrations that I have written and six have already been applied to the database, the frameworks, most of them, look into the database and see, oh, I have applied six, like one to six, already to the database. And there's the seventh one sitting on the file system. I'm going to take the seventh and apply to the database. Right? So this is a good way of keeping track of what was applied to the database, what needs to be applied. And that way, you can keep track of what state the database is in. Right? So that's one other way, good way of keeping track of my application code version and the database state version. Right? If they both match, your application runs fine in whatever environment. If they don't match, then you'll start seeing errors like column not found or table not found, view not found, or sometimes you may get weird state conditions where the schema that your program is expecting is not in the database. Right? So let's say your program is expecting a table called client in the database, and you have not applied that change yet. The program's going to complain, I can't find a table called client. 
So to get away with that, you need to keep track of what version of the application works with what version of the database, right? And this is a good way to keep track of that. The reason why you need to keep track of all of this is because your database is in the middle of a host of things that are happening at a company, right? Like sometimes it's your application that you're writing here and invariably someone else will hook onto the database and start taking extracts out of the database. Someone will start putting data into your database. Someone will start publishing stuff out. Someone will start doing something. Someone will put like a change a CDC kind of framework on your database and start taking events like customer name change and that kind of stuff. So that becomes your central integration point in your enterprise. And the moment you change something here, all of these applications are gonna fall apart, right? Let's say again, if you had a client table and you suddenly thought client is not representing what the concept is, let me change it to party, for example. The moment you change it to party, everybody else who was depending on the client name is now lost or cannot access the table anymore and things like that. So one other concept in this kind of change movement is to keep track of what was your old version and what's your new version, like interfaces, right? Like for example, if you're giving out APIs, like developers gives out APIs to other people to access, and if you change the API structure, the calling person or the calling function is gonna fall apart, right? So what do we do? We give them two versions, like this is the old version, this is the new version, like some way to interface that out, right? You can do the same thing. And that can be done by using this timeline of a chain. Like you, you, you do some changes, and that's a, there's a start of that change, and there's a transition period, and then once the transition is done, you basically deprecate the old out or delete the old out, and that's the end part of that, right? So let's see some uh, examples of that, right? So for example, I was talking about this customer, and I'm changing the name to first name and last name, and first name and last name is what stays after I'm done with my change, right? So how do I keep the calling people, like all the other applications around my application that are calling into my database or writing to my database, reading from my database, working while I'm moving this change through, right? That's the basic here. So let's assume the data is that, and when I expand it out, like the data still, say the name column is still there, and the first name and last name is split out like this, right? And when everything is done, like deprecation and all of that stuff is done, this is what remains in the table, right? So if you take that example, right, I can start with that. I can do this without data migration, right? Like the name is still there, but the first name and last name is null. Your customers most likely won't like this, right? If their names start showing up as null. If you do data migration, then you're gonna get that, right? The name column has that, and the first name and last name is there, right? So those are two options that I can follow, and when they contract, the first name and last name stays that, right? So let's see a simple scenario here. I'm gonna just add two columns where I'm not doing any data migration. It's just first name and last name, and if I want to roll back this change, I can say drop columns and roll back that change, right? I can go a little further and say, I can, I'm gonna add those two columns, and I'm also gonna add a trigger where if someone writes to the name column, I'm gonna split that data out and write to the first name and last name. If someone writes to the first name and last name, I'm gonna merge that and put it in the name column, right? So this is a way to synchronize that data, right? Why would I want to do that, right? Why would you want to do this is because if someone, some old program is coming and reading the name column, they get that data. If someone new application is coming and reading, they get the new data based on the first name and last name. If some old program writes to the name old column, which is the name column, I can split that data and then write to the first name so it's accessible to everyone, right? So you are giving a good path for migrating from old to new, legacy to new, right? And this happens a lot, especially in enterprises, because you have long running programs and you cannot really deploy frequently. If you are a startup, you are deploying frequently and you can catch up faster. But if you are in an enterprise situation, not all programs are going at the same pace. So you need to give people time to catch up, right? So this is a way to give them time to catch up to the pace at which other programs are moving. And maybe six months or a year later, you can take this out because now everyone is using the new structure, right? So when you contract, you can just drop the column off and you're done. Like now the table just has first name and last, right? 
You can also do when the drop takes forever, like if you are, let's say you have 10 million customers, then the drop will take forever, lock up your table, you can just say unused and drop during maintenance periods or maintenance windows later on or like a month or so later, right? Even then, even after your drop, there may be some situations where people still want to access the old column because that program's not been changed in like 40 years and it's not gonna be changed in the next 40 years, right? So you can create a virtual function or something like that on the table so that that old program still keeps on working, right? So again, a, a way to give them an interface to your schema, right? Uh, I personally think a schema is nothing but an API on top of your data, right? So if you really think about it that way and you want to keep the API constant, the way to do that is to provide these kinds of uh, different methods for them to get at your data, right? Once you have get into this kind of state, your application code hopefully is still under continuous integration. Now you can put your database stuff also under continuous integration so that the application and the database changes are also tested and you have confidence in the quality of those changes that are coming through, right? So what's a good way to do that? Like assuming you are in this kind of setup right now where a DBA team is doing changes to the dev database and the DBA team is pushing stuff into your UAT production QA environments, right? So from this state on, we are gonna go to the new state of doing these things, right? So don't do that centralized control. Do your migration scripts that we talked about in this place. And this is where the DBAs pair or the data people pair with the developers, right? It could be data architects, it could be data modelers, it could be DBAs, whatever setup you have in your uh, organization. They are pairing with the developers here and making the change. They are actually putting the change in version control, right? And then that version control kicks off a CI build, right? It could be Jenkins, it could be like GoCD, it could be whatever you are using, Bamboo, TeamCD, whatever it is, right? And then that continuous integration uses a totally different database, right? Not the same as the DevDB here, but uses a totally different database. Again, works on my database, works on my data, uh, works on my schema, all of that have to be taken out of the equation. It needs to work on a fresh uh, setup of stuff, right? So once the build passes, you can apply those migration scripts and then package them. Just like any other jar you package, you package all of your database stuff, right? And again, everything is packaged here, which includes your schema changes, your view changes, stored product changes, uh, trigger changes, whatever that is got to do with the database. So you create a package. Now when you create a package here, along with that package, you are also creating a war or a jar or a DLL or whatever you package, right? So at this point, you know for sure that your database scripts and your application package both work together because this build was successful at this point. They both work together, right? So from now here, you can deploy that same packages wherever you want, right? So build number 10 that came out of here, build number 10 that came out of here can also be applied to like the database as well as to the containers where the application is being deployed or wherever that needs to go. Right? So you know these two packages together work together. Right? So that, I think, is a very critical factor in this stuff. Right? So the application jar as well as the upgrade jar, they're both at the same place, can be downloaded by like, the system ops and the DBA ops, for example, if you have two setups or two uh, types of people working on that kind of setup. They can all be downloaded by the same team and taken from there on. So you, there is no question of what version of the database works with what version of the application. It's all published at the same place, right? So a simple workflow for like any new development or anything like that is like someone creates a new migration, right? A new table or whatever pairs with their DBAs. Then the same thing is committed into either a get or subversion or whatever version control system you have going on. The CI sub, up server applies this new migration to a different database called a CI database. And then somebody else can update that version control also, right? Like let's say I checked in a Delta file or a migration script, and then Bob also downloads that. Now they have that new version. They may not have worked on it, but they got the new version because as code changes, the database has also change, and the other team members need to get those database changes also, right? So that's what's happening here because Joe made the change, but Emily is also getting the change. 
And she can apply it to her own local database, just like how you would apply it to a CI database or to a QA database or to a production. So that's one other method of moving changes from one place to another place, right? A good thing that happens in this kind of setup is Joe here can keep on making changes without affecting anybody else because he's working in his own local copy and he's not affecting the whole team, right? If you're working in a common database setup, like one database and 10 developers, if Joe makes that change and he drops a table because that's what he wants to do, the other nine people who are working on that particular database now don't have that table anymore. Till the time Joe actually checks in his stuff and has committed and the tests have passed and everything like that, right? So that period, they are all suffering with the lack of this structure being in a uh, transient state, right? So that, that's one other reason why everybody should get their own schema to work. So that they can experiment, they can play with it, they can be comfortable with what changes they have made, and once they check in, everybody gets that change. But at that point, the code and the database both work together fine, and there is no transient phase for the rest of the team, right? So what this does is basically abstracts or gives you a way to abstract the dev concerns away from the physical layout and that kind of stuff, right? A good way to do that is, like for example, if you have a big uh, production setup or things like that, right? A good way to do that is in a developer space, you can have like everything sits in the same space. You don't have that much data or millions of users and that kind of stuff. So the devs can have everything compiled and shot and in a, in a Docker container and stuff like that. But once you go to production, the physical setup is different, right? You have a primary, if you have a rack or something like that, a replicated setup, there may be multiple things going on. You may have many more uh, disks, you may have SANS in play and things like that. A good way to do that is abstract that away from the developer and let the DBA focus on the physical setup here. And a good way to make sure that uh, a, a DBA gets more control over what goes on in production setup versus a developer setup is to create some kind of maps where this table belongs to this uh, particular space, table space, and this table belongs to this particular table space. And in the dev setup, all of them can belong to the same table space. And in production, they can belong to their own individual table space based on like usability, size, and whatever other kind of production uh, constraints you have around sizes and things like that, right? So this abstracts away the production constraints of the environment away from developers. But at the same time, gives DBAs the power to decide the physical layout of the database, right? So similarly, when you are doing these changes, you can apply like a change to your own schema. You can apply the same change to a QA environment, to a production environment. It should be like a command. It shouldn't be any more difficult than uh, applying stuff to your database or things like that, right? So again, automation comes into play here is a DBA can just say upgrade QA and it upgrades QA to whatever version you want and off he goes, right? Again, one of the big things that I have focused a lot over a period of years is I don't want to be in the office after five, right? And if I can make this stuff easy, I can just like make it part of the deployment process pipeline itself then let it be. Like I don't want to be sitting around in the office after five. I don't want to be working weekends. I don't want to be waking up in the night to do deployments and things like that. So automation becomes a key factor here is once you have it down to a command like this, you can just embed this command in your application deployment, right? And then the DBA doesn't need to be involved. It, like maybe you only discuss about this when stuff breaks and that's it, right? And the last, I think the most important thing is deploy frequently. Like if you're deploying once a year, you're carrying one year worth of changes in that deployment and it carries a lot of risk, uh, carries a lot of like weight around it, like in terms of amount of stuff that's gonna change and things like that, testing becomes hard and things like that. But at the same time, if you're deploying like say once a week, then the amount of changes that you're pushing through within that window is small. So you can actually see what's going on, changes actually run faster, and in probably five minutes you're out the door, like okay, time to go now, right? So I remember one client where we moved from like six month deployment window to like deploying every Thursday. And it was very liberating in terms of the risk we are carrying, and at the same time, every Thursday we would start around like 4.50 or so, and 5.15 or so we are out the door 
back to our day stuff to do at home and things like that, right? So that is more important. Like sometimes it seems deploying more frequently, you're taking on more risk, but it's actually the other way around. Because you're deploying more frequently, you're reducing risk because the amount of change is smaller, right? So that's all I had to say, and it's right at the time here, 10.45. So if you have any questions, you can hang around here. There's a break coming up, I think 15 minutes. I can answer those. Uh, and I'm still in the demo area, around the conference area, and like until tomorrow morning. So you can stop me anytime and ask questions and things like that. Thank you.